it's Caitlin from C-SPAN. Did you know that C-SPAN has been serving the American people for 45 years? Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners. And now, with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45. Your contribution helps to ensure that we can continue to provide unfiltered, complete coverage of government proceedings on TV, online, on radio, and our mobile app, as well as context through newsletters, social media, and podcasts. Join us in preserving this legacy of access to the democratic process. Make your tax-deductible donation today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. And welcome to About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. We look at the business of publishing and we talk with authors about their work as well. In just a minute, we're gonna be joined by columnist Danny Heitman of the Baton Rouge Advocate to talk about rereading the classics. But first, wanna let you know that all Book TV programs are available online at booktv.org. Danny Heitman, In the Wall Street Journal, you wrote a column entitled, I'm Revisiting the Books of My Youth. Why are you doing that? Well, Peter, I'm revisiting the books of my youth uh, basically based on my rediscovery of my Norton Anthology of American Literature that I used as a college student a uh, freshman college student in 1982. And as you can see, it's really born the years. Uh, it's now uh, held together with some uh, duct tape. And basically in the course of cleaning up my house and tidying things up, I decided I'm gonna take this old book from the shelf and I'm going to repair it. And the course of repairing it, I reconnected with some of the wisdom that was in it. Wisdom that, to be frank, uh, was not well received when I was uh, a freshman college student because, quite frankly, I was too young to really appreciate what writers like uh, Henry David Thoreau or Ralph Waldo Emerson or Emily Dickinson uh, had to tell me. So, um, in reconnecting with that as an older person, uh, I realized that a lot of that uh, literature really resonates as you add more birthdays, as I have and as everybody had. So that's what really reignited my uh, desire to, to to really revisit these classics and uh, to engage with them as a source of uh, instruction in my daily life. And in your column, you quote Margaret Eyre Burns as saying, the trouble with education is that we always read everything when we are too young to know what it means. And the trouble with life is that we're always too busy to reread it later. That's true, isn't it? I mean, when I was a college freshman and I was listening to Henry David Thoreau uh, talk about the uh, advantages of having very few possessions, uh, it really fell on deaf ears with me because I didn't have anything uh, to speak of. I was a poor college student. I had a, a very old jalopy of a car that I used to get back and forth to class. And my aspirations at that time were to acquire more stuff, like uh, a lot of young people. And so uh, Thoreau, quite frankly, struck me as, as an oddball. Uh, he, here was a guy who lived in a cabin out by the woods, did not have any uh, obvious means of income, 
Uh, he didn't seem to have any kind of romantic life, which is something that, like a lot of college students, I also wanted. And uh, the other thing that struck me about him is in pictures, I noticed that he had pretty strange hair. And uh, and uh, viewers might find this hard to believe, but uh, back in college when I had a little bit more hair myself, uh, I thought, hey, it'd be great to really have a, have a keen uh, hairstyle uh, that would be attractive to members of the opposite sex. And... Um, you know, Thoreau kind of looked like a guy with bedhead. So this was not a guy that uh, I automatically looked to as a hero as a college freshman. Well, fast forward a few decades, you know, uh, now that I'm a guy who's had a mortgage, who's uh, filled a backyard shed with more tools than I can ever use and shelves with more books than I can ever read and a closet with more shirts than I could ever wear, of course, now what Thoreau was saying means just so much more to me. And uh, it's just kind of a fundamental irony of life that whenever we're introduced to uh, these great works of literature in school, we're just often just, frankly, just too young to really appreciate what these writers are trying to tell us. So it's been a real uh, blessing in my life uh, to be able to connect as an older person and really grasp more deeply what these uh, books have to tell me. So, Danny Heitman, even though you don't necessarily write about this, um, what's the solution to that young problem reading old writers and their wisdom? How do we, how do we reconcile those things? I think one thing that is important is to create opportunities uh, for these books to greet us uh, throughout our lives, even after we leave college. And a really great way to do that is to curate these books in a bright and interesting way that even after we leave college, we might be tempted to go and reconnect with them. Uh, a very powerful example with me is after I had left uh, after I had left my American Lit class, uh, and a couple of years later, I uh, had a summer internship on Capitol Hill. And as I was on my lunch hour, and I was leaving the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, a little fleck of green. Uh, caught the corner of my eye, I pivoted, and there was a brightly illustrated edition of Walden uh, there on the shelf of the uh, gift shop. And just seeing Walden curated in that bright, interesting way really kind of prompted me to revisit it again. Now, I still was not fully receptive to its message, but I do think it underscores the value of just our popular culture continuing to reintroduce these works to us. I'm going to give you a great example of that. I have a I have a, a really nice abridgment of Henry David Thoreau's journals that was published uh, a few years ago by New York Review Books. Really nice, bright paperback. And this is the kind of thing that a younger person might be tempted uh, to pick up. The other thing, and I just cannot say enough good things about the uh, Library of America, which is a nonprofit organization that curates really the definitive editions of uh, classic American literature. They're also a great resource if you wanna uh, really revisit these great works of literature. This edition right here is an edition of Emerson Selected Journals. And this book is really dear to me because I think in Emerson's journals, you really connect with a man who's a lot more emotionally vulnerable than the Ralph Waldo Emerson of his essays. And his essays, he can kind of come across, quite frankly, as a little bit pompous. Uh, there's a great uh, upcoming biography. It's going to be due out this spring of Ralph Waldo Emerson by 
James Marcus, uh, glad to the brink of fear. And Marcus very humorously says that Ralph Waldo Emerson can seem to him kind of like that uncle at holiday gatherings who is dispensing advice that you really don't want to hear, just a little bit of a bore. In Emerson's journals, though, you see a man who's really struggling. He's struggling with grief. He's struggling with wonder. He's struggling with the whole idea of religion and how to best honor divinity and the cosmos. And this is a guy that a young person would be much more inclined to embrace than the Emerson who is sometimes taught in American lit class. So um, I think movie culture is a great way to reconnect us with the classics. So many great uh, adaptations of uh, Jane Austen novels as an example. And uh, also just biographies uh, that kind of give us a new dimension of these uh, figures. You know, like uh, there's a wonderful recent biography of Henry David Thoreau by Laura Dasso Walls. She connects you with Thoreau as someone who has just got a lot more dimensions than the guy just hanging out, uh, you know, by the pond, trying to think great thoughts. There's a great uh, recent anthology about Henry David Thoreau, Now Comes Good Sailing. It's edited by Andrew Blonner. A lot of great writers who talk about how Thoreau is deeply relevant to them and the modern lives that they lead. And probably my favorite essay in here is by George Howe Colt, who's just really a neat writer. The name of his essay is Thoreau on Ice. And he talks about uh, the fact that Thoreau just really enjoyed ice skating and he just had a great time out on the ice. This is not a Henry David Thoreau that we typically think about, uh, a guy who's out there having fun. And so, um, I, I just think if we cr can create as many opportunities as possible for readers to simply happen upon these writers again, then uh, that's all to our benefit. Danny Heitman, besides Thoreau, Dickinson, Emerson, who else, what other authors are contained in your edition of Norton Anthology? Well, uh, one writer that uh, I really wanted to point out is Elizabeth Bishop, who is just a fabulous uh, American poet who just wrote with such absolute precision about her inner life. And, you know, one of the complications is any uh, teacher can tell you of teaching a survey course is you just cannot get to every writer in this anthology. So I was not exposed to Elizabeth Bishop uh, through classroom instruction. She is someone that I happened across again in this book. And um, I revisited her uh, while recuperating from uh, getting my wisdom teeth out. And I was heavily sedated. Uh, I was then alone in my apartment. And uh, there was a public television documentary uh, on about Elizabeth uh, Bishop. And they were reciting her poem, One Art, which is about the art of losing. And uh, Bishop says, ironically, the art of losing isn't hard to master. And what she's really saying is, losing and loss in life uh, can indeed be very hard to master. I was just entranced by the quality of her language. And it occurred to me the next morning that maybe I had been charmed by Bishop because I was so heavily sedated after uh, dental surgery. So I went and pulled my Norton Anthology off the shelf from college and revisited uh, her work or 
to put to put it more accurately, I visited her work for the first time in this anthology, and I found it every bit as magical uh, as I had the day before. Uh, another great writer that uh, is in the anthology uh, that is just more relevant than ever is James Baldwin. Uh, great uh, excerpt of The Fire Next Time. James Baldwin, of course, was a formative African-American writer. But I really would caution people, uh, don't just connect with James Baldwin because he speaks so eloquently about the African-American experience, uh, connect with James Baldwin because he connects eloquently with universal human experience. That's what uh, all great writers do. And uh, whenever he talks about, in that great essay of his, A Stranger in the Village, he talks about being in Switzerland and being the only person of color in this little village. You know, on one level, it's a contemplation of race. On another level, it's a contemplation of the degree to which all of us, whatever our walks of life, at some point, we're outsiders. And he connects with that experience so powerfully and with such poetic sentences that uh, he's just a writer that everybody should read. Danny Heitman, the Norton Anthology has been expanded over the years to include newer writers. I bet that's a fun debate at the Norton Company when they decide who to include with that. Um, what do you think about the expansions? Well, that's all to the good. I mean, canons, literary canons are reconsidered with every generation. And uh, I just think it's great that, uh, that that's done. Uh, I, you know, again, think that uh, while it's great to include writers because uh, perhaps they come from underrepresented communities, I also think it's important for people to really value these writers because if they're great writers, they speak to universal experiences. An example of that from British literature for me is Virginia Woolf. Uh, Virginia Woolf is widely celebrated and rightly so as uh, a great uh, feminist writer and as someone who spoke very powerfully about uh, the marginalizations of uh, women in this wonderful essay she wrote about a room uh, called A Room of One's Own. She talked about the, uh, the wrongheaded policies that excluded women from higher education. Uh, and I think, you know, anybody can get great instruction and in injustice by reading that. At the same time, uh, I don't read Virginia Woolf because I have to. I don't read her from a sense of grudging uh, civic duty. I read Virginia Woolf because, gosh, her sentences are just so beautiful. They're so perfectly balanced. They're just like a butterfly that has landed on a rose. And they're just gorgeous sentences. And um, I... Right now, I've, I've, I've been involved in reading her journals. That's, that's how I've uh, spent the past few weeks, uh, you know, reading her, her diary entries. Uh, that's where you kind of get a very intimate look of uh, Virginia Woolf at ground level. Uh, there's a wonderful little passage that I read yesterday where she's scolding herself and saying, you know, I really should have spent more time uh, writing today, but instead I baked a cake, you know, and that's kind of a neat thing. And we can all relate to that because all of us are really uh, getting in mood sometimes where we, we have work to do, but instead of doing the work that we should be doing, we do other stuff that seems more fun. Danny Heitman is a columnist for the Baton Rouge Advocate publication. And I'll tell you that one of the classics that I return to again and again is one that takes place in your neck of the woods. 
A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. You know, uh, I have a little quirk. And uh, even though I'm a book reviewer, uh, I occasionally write a few book reviews for the Wall Street Journal and other places. And I'm someone who's constantly urging people uh, to read this and read that. I tend to get my back up whenever somebody says, you really need to read this. And my uh, first encounter with uh, Confederacy of Dunces is when it was published when I was in high school. And a friend of mine met me in the hall uh, while we were on our way to class. And he said, you have absolutely got to read Confederacy of Dunces. And I thought, mm, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to read that. But uh, eventually, just uh, just to placate my friend, I I started reading it, and it really had a subversive effect on me. It is so rip roaringly funny that uh, I would think about it while I was in biology class, or while I was in physics class, or while I was in English class, I, and I would just have this uncontrollable urge. To laugh, and it has been, you know, one of my all-time favorite books ever since then. The reason that I love it so much is the main character, uh, like so many of us who read the headlines every day, he is thoroughly convinced that the rest of the world is populated by idiots. And as you continue to read uh, the book, which you which you slowly come to understand is our, our hero, Ignatius Riley, while he's condemning everyone for being absolute fools, he is actually the biggest fool in the book. And it's the, the book is really two things for me. It is kind of an observation of someone who's, who's essentially an extended adolescence. Uh, he thinks people in authority or do, dollars. He just uh, is so exasperated that the world hasn't quite caught up to his ideas of how the world should be. That is very much an adolescent sensibility, which is why it, it just really struck me so deeply in high school. Uh, but the book is also uh, a kind of a, an observation about our own moral uh, blindness. We always think the other person is absolutely wrong. <laughs> And if they would just come around to our way of thinking, then the world would be better. And quite often we're flawed too. And I mean, is is there a better book to read right now uh, with our country being so divided as it is, as a book that's really about the fact that we need to look at our own foibles? I mean, that is really what makes Confederacy of Books a, just an eternal classic. And I'm really glad that you brought it up. Danny Heitman, where are you in the Norton Anthology right now? What are you reading? Well, um, I have recently uh, been uh, rereading uh, Emerson again. Uh, you know, Emerson's essays, the first time I read them, I was really, uh, really put off by what I consider to be a kind of a sense of dry certitude in his essays. Uh, he seems in his essay sometimes more as if he's proclaiming a truth uh, than actually proving a truth. Uh, he simply offers these observations and uh, kind of makes you feel like uh, they're settled, settled. And um, reading his journals really brought me to uh, want to reread the essays. And now that I'm reading them, uh, I have a greater appreciation of how hard earned those, uh, those truths were that Emerson uh, came across. And uh, because he was a guy who, who struggled, uh, first of all, with organized religion and how do we best you know, honor God uh, even when we feel that uh, church life uh, is emotionally distant from us. Uh, he also struggled with grief. 
Uh, he lost a wife uh, very early in his first marriage. And uh, so, you know, the ability to reconnect with these essays and read them, you know, knowing uh, what I know now about Emerson uh, has really uh, brought a whole new dimension to that experience for me. I wanted to share uh, something that I, that I found in his journals that really kind of gives us a different Emerson than the guy who, who kind of feels like he's had it all figured out. Uh, Emerson says, good writing is a kind of skating which carries off the performer where he would not go. <laughs> you know, so here's a guy who's basically saying, when you're a writer, you have to give yourself permission to go to places that you did not expect to end up. And this is the Emerson that I really like to hold to heart as opposed to the guy who kind of sounds like he is per, uh, offering pronouncements from a pulpit, so. And Danny Heitman writes in the Wall Street Journal, as the obligations of marriage and parenthood kept me home more often, I reread passages from Thoreau's Walden for instruction in how to savor small moments outside my doorstep. In the wake of family deaths, I found Emerson's quiet resolve after his own losses and inspiration. Dickinson, whose poems remained open to joy as the country careened toward the Civil War, offers me a model in seeking serenity amid social division. Danny Heitman, we appreciate your time on Book TV. Thank you, it's great to join you from Phi Kappa Phi, where I edit Forum Magazine, and uh, I am really grateful for the opportunity to connect today. Thank you, sir. And thanks for joining us for About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV, all Book TV programs are available online to watch at booktv.org.